Hi, my name is Colleen Hummeling from Florida State University. I have the great opportunity of sharing some insights to the field as the AMA has given me a few minutes of your time. And what I thought I would do with this time is to talk about some myths that I think rob our best minds and how creating breathing room can help us avoid the myths entirely and then also present you with a few hacks to help you work through them should these um, challenges arise. And so what I'd love to do, or the purpose of this slide deck, is to help shift your perspective from the fear of the clip, which we often feel that we are on with the amazing amounts of pressure we put on ourselves in this career, to the beauty of the open space, which is what this career offers to us in the autonomy we have to create the life that we want in this space. And so when I say breathing room, I mean exactly that, sufficient room to breathe and move comfortably. And what I mean about that in our career is that we often are facing these seemingly insurmountable deadlines or seemingly impossible tasks of publishing in super high journals or meeting our teaching demands. And when we don't build in adequate breathing room, this career can trick ourselves into believing that our next big opportunity is an inconvenient obligation. Your family, friends, or hobbies are frivolous and cannot receive time. People are working against you. And your unbelievably perfect life is anything but. These are, in fact, quite delusional thoughts. We have an incredible community of people who are here to help us through this career. And our friends and family are the most important part and usually the motivation for why we started this career. And so it's important to know how to keep breath this breathing room in our lives. What I think can happen is that we develop these myths, and this first myth has a lot to do with our inner monologue. So I want you to take a moment and think about what your inner monologue is saying to you. For many of this, it is filled with things like personal lies, these what-if spirals, so what if my paper gets rejected? What if I never get a job? What if, what if, what if? these unvalidated fears about the future or these imagined consequences of our actions. And so this perpetuates this first myth that we are not good enough. And when we start to believe these types of thoughts, there enters this first horseman, what I am labeling self-doubt. This is something that we all experience and it's a challenge that is a little difficult to overcome. And so I'll offer a few hacks that have been helpful in my own life. And the first is just recognizing that we are all on the slightly imperfect path to finding our better selves and that we're on a learning curve that doesn't move in a straight line. And so you uh, first, the first time that you do something, it takes an excruciatingly long time compared to the second time and then the third time. And, and as you do this and as you become a master of that task, you are creating br breathing room just by making something unfamiliar, familiar and assumed. But as this process is unfolding, the one thing you'll have to try to remember is to be gentle with yourself. That it is part of the process and knowing that your future self is going to be thankful for all the time and energy you put into learning that seemingly impossible task. The second hack, which I think is really helpful and also very self-revealing, is to build a one-day folder. And this is a folder that I have on my computer where you put versions of yourself that you aren't quite at yet. So, this could be exemplars of the future year, you. So for example, I have TED Talks in there that have been really inspiring for the day that I have something important enough that they might put it into a talk. And then the second one is to change those what-if spirals. We're often imagining these very negative consequences for the future, but if these are just imagined, then why not imagine something positive? And so what if my paper gets accepted? What if my advisor loves my work? What if this paper changes what we're doing and how we're doing it from here forward. And then the third one, which I find is the absolute most effective way at changing this self-doubt personal inner monologue is to shape your outer voice or shape your outer voice, which will automatically change your inner voice. So helping other people have more positive what if spirals, reminding them that this one moment in time might have a bigger purpose to shape them to their higher selves. And the second myth, and for this one, I'd love for you to just sit and think about what are your work habits? Where do you traditionally type away, write away, grade away? For many of this, this is in an isolated room or sometimes late at night. 
And this types of condition can perpetuate the second myth, that you are all alone. And when you are all alone, you can start to think these somewhat delusional thoughts, which I have titled the second horseman as resentment. And resentment is just this fear of unfairness or that things are not working the way that you think. And this, this sort of arises when you're imagining what other people are doing when you're not around and witnessing all that you are doing. And so there are a lot of ways to avoid this type of sort of delusional thinking as well. And um, one of the most effective ways in my life was to build a virtual co cohort. And this was a group of humans that were sort of aspiring to the same goals as me, but weren't co-locating with me. And so I think there are some really important key players in this. And the first one is the cheerleader, the person who can always see your strengths, even when you cannot. The second one is the connector, the person who will introduce you to the person that you need to know. The third is the instructor, the person who can teach you how to do almost anything. And the third is, or the fourth is the organizer. So the person who always knows when something is happening and when, where you need to be at that moment in time. The really in incredible thing about these virtual cohorts is that when they're put together properly, they remove some of your own fears. And not because you're afraid you can't do it, because they eliminate the need for fear entirely. When people around you that are in the same situation as you are doing the things you want to do, you don't even question the fact that you can do those as well. And so it's, it eliminates the need for courage and just makes what possi what's possible even more um, attainable. The tricky part about this is we live in the world of public CVs and Googleable accomplishments. And sometimes these cohorts can lead to unhealthy benchmarking. And so just remember that everyone's successful life looks differently. And be sure that you know how yours should look and that you have someone in your cohort to remind you of this. Be your best, not the best. And then the, another really awesome hack for this and to battle this second horseman is to never work alone. So find a time to do happy hour brainstorms or even just virtually share an office. So I've worked oftentimes all over Zoom with a co-author or a colleague, and that helps you to realize that you're all putting in that same amount of time. And then this third myth, I'd love for you to sort of reflect on when do you hit your exhaustion point? We all have them, and oftentimes it's not just one thing, you know, we all have demands outside of this space. But when they come, they can trigger some kinds of thoughts that are even more detrimental to ourselves and can kind of get in the way of what we are wanting to accomplish. So this third myth, none of this matters, can trigger apathy. And this, I think, is the third horseman that can rob our best minds. Um, and some of the things that can overcome this is to remind yourself of what inspired you to get into this career in the first place. And I do this by obsessively studying the greats, reading the inspirational papers that you read in the beginning of this career, and then studying the structure of them, because it's not just none of this matters, but sometimes it's a, I haven't got anything done in the last week, two weeks, or anything to show for this. So if you study the anatomy of these remarkable papers, you can start to emulate them better and feel more productive about yourself. And just remember that your dream mentor may not may be an anonymous guide, like an AE or a reviewer. And then battling apathy is also a lot of thinking. And so just be suspicious and a little bit skeptical about how you're measuring your worth. If your worth depends on how you perform relative to your peers or how others judge you, you will never be happy for long because you will always find another benchmark that is performing slightly better. And then Remember that mediocrity is just a not nice word that we give to the same conditions that define contentment. And so being content exactly where you are is a wonderful gift to yourself. And then when you are writing, write for impact, write for you. The best papers are the ones that change you, your view of the world or your role in it. And when you've done that, you've accomplished something in and of yourself that doesn't need external validation. So if there were some things I would say you could do today, I would first say that you are good enough. Put one thing in your one day folder. You are not alone. Introduce one person to one person they should know. And control your what ifs. Unsubscribe to any dangerous distractions. 
And that can be entertainment, that can be types of news, that can be conversation partners that help to fuel dangerous personal lives. So remember, you are not helpless, you're never hopeless. And together, we can do this.